chapter 5, beginning in our section, second section of the book of Hebrews, uh, a lot to discuss tonight, some really good stuff, uh, it'll kind of test your knowledge of uh, the Old Testament, and particularly several books in the first uh, part of the Old Testament, so uh, I hope you're ready for tonight, got your outline, got your Bible ready to go, uh, got your hymn book ready to go, we're going to sing a few songs and we'll get started here in just a moment. Uh, men, don't forget about our men's fellowship Thursday night at 6 o'clock at Chapalaya Cafe. Uh, still a lot of going on in the lines of disaster relief, but I think we can praise the Lord that the one that's out in the Gulf is going to have very little impact for it. So that is something to really, really, really praise the Lord about. But uh, still be praying for those who are responding to those uh, in need in uh, Western North Carolina, Eastern Kentucky, North Georgia, in those areas. Uh, that's going to be going on for months now. So uh, be praying about how you can be involved, how you can help, and uh, be, be praying for those who are on the ground doing the work now as we speak. A lot of things coming up in our association, a lot of things coming up in our ministerial alliance. Next Sunday evening, we will not be here at 6 o'clock. We will be out at Bethel for our annual ministerial alliance Thanksgiving worship celebrations, so I hope you'll join us for that. And then the following Sunday on the 24th at 6 o'clock, we will have our Friendsgiving meal and fellowship over in our fellowship hall. So be thinking about what you're going to bring, your, either your side item, your dessert. Uh, be inviting those folks to come and join us and just uh, allow them to experience what the Lord is doing here at First Baptist Church. Many other things coming up. I think we have all the supplies for our uh, street ministry in New Orleans next Saturday, so thank you for responding to that. If you're still interested in going, uh, let me know so I can get your name on the list and let you know about what time and where we'll be meeting at. Uh, also, we are gathering items for our annual Thanksgiving food baskets connected with our uh, benevolence ministry, so if you are interested in that, see Joyce, and I'll get you a list that's out in the foyer and uh, bring those items by Friday. So. We're looking forward to what the Lord has to say. Brother John Logan, would you open us up in a word of prayer, please? Let's stand as we sing, Jesus is the sweetest name I know. Don't worry about standing because it's only two, but we'll only sing it twice. <laughs> First John 4, 19 says, and it tells us because he first loved us. The name of the song is I Love Thee. I Love Thee, I Love Thee, O Lord. Thank you.
Okay. <laughs> 211 in the hymn. is thy name. Let's 
you have your Bibles tonight, Hebrews chapter 5, wrapped up the first section of the book of Hebrews last week as we concluded chapter 4. If your Bible has outlines in it, you'll notice that the book of Hebrews is divided into four or five different sections. Uh, the first section is kind of an introduction and he alludes to what we'll be talking about tonight and he mentions the high priest and his role. We have a merciful and faithful high priest in things pertaining to God. Uh, several times he mentions that, but now we really get into the specifics about it. And what we have to unpack tonight really, really goes back on the reason that we can boldly approach this throne of grace, as we found out at the end of chapter 4 last week. So if you've ever made a commitment to read through the Bible from Genesis 1 to Revelation to the end, you'll know that more than likely you get bogged down in one particular area. Has anyone else ever decided that they were going to read through the Bible and gotten bogged down in the book of Leviticus? <laughs> that's usually the place where I always got bogged down at, or as that old country preacher said, that's kind of a Hypocritical, hypocritical statement being called as someone an old country preacher, huh? Uh, that's the way he called it, the book of Leviticus. Uh, you'll, you'll know that those books are important. Uh, they're there for a reason. They're there for us. So they don't really make the greatest reading of all uh, compared to some of the other books of the Bible, but they are there to teach us and set us up and give us a shadow of things to come in the New Testament. And I think what we see tonight in the qualifications of the high priest it's really something that we learned all the way back in the book of Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. We have a lot of what we're going to cover tonight that will go along with what we're studying in the book of Deuteronomy on Wednesday night. So a lot of parallels to go with here. There's also some comparison and some contrast as well. Uh, three main features of the earthly high priest as he is found in the Old Testament as compared to Jesus as our great high priest. So verses 1 through 4 of the book of Hebrews chapter 5 uh, covers the qualifications of the priesthood. What did it take for someone to stand in the position of a high priest back in the Old Testament? That's what the writer focuses on uh, as he goes from approaching God's throne of grace to this matter of the high priest. And then verses 4 through about 10, we're going to go all the way through 11 tonight, and then verses 5 through 10 kind of focus on that comparison of Jesus as our great high priest and what he had to do to make sure that that role and those essential qualifications were fulfilled. So one of the first things that we see in verse 1 is that the earthly high priest was humanly appointed. While God had said the priests are all going to come from a certain tribe, the tribe of Levi, they would all be descendants of Aaron, would be the great high priest of the time. Uh, all of the earthly high priests were humanly appointed. As one would pass away, the other one would come along behind. Someone would have to make sure that someone was stepping into that role of the high priest in the Old Testament. The writer of Hebrews says this. He says, for every high priest is taken from among men, is appointed for men in things pertaining to God, that he may offer both gifts and sacrifices for sin. So there's three main essential qualifications for a person to have served in the role of the high priest. And verse 1 deals with the initial one. First, he was appointed on men's behalf to deal with the things concerning God. So now as you think about that, kind of consider how you would have fallen in that role. Would you have met those qualifications? Where would you have stood as far as the qualification goes for this role of a high priest? Would you be willing to stand in the gap for someone on behalf of their sins? Would you be willing to be that go-to person, that go-between person between a human being and God Almighty? How would you feel as you approached uh, the Holy of Holies in preparation of making atonement for the sins of your people on that one day, knowing that you yourself had to have your own personal orders in line before you made that appeal? Would you be a little bit nervous? Would you be a little bit fearful? 
it's pretty much a daunting task. So just think about the person who filled that role as the earthly high priest. He was appointed by one person or, or by a group of people to go before God Almighty and to make atonement for the sins of people by making the sacrifices. He would take the blood, he would splash it on the mercy seat. Uh, he would go before the Lord in behalf of his people. So the first essential qualification is that he was appointed on men's behalf to deal with the things concerning God. Now keep in mind, here, here's one thing that we're going to focus on as we get to the uh, tail end of these points. This high priest did not go out looking for people in whom he would have to make atonement for. They would have to come to him. This wasn't something that he would stand on the street corner asking for people, hey, have you sinned today? Hey, did you do something wrong? Hey, is there something in your life that you need to make a sacrifice? Well, come on, let's go to the temple. Let's take care of it. No, they had to come to him. They knew what the law was. They knew what was going on. They knew what they had to do to get their lives in line with the Lord. So the next thing we see in verse 2 is that the earthly high priest could have compassion on failures. Verse 2 says this. It says, he can have compassion on those who are ignorant. Now, that word there in the original Greek language is the word agneo. It's where we get our word agnostic from. And it simply means that those who are ignorant or those who have gone astray. They have willfully sinned for a lack of knowledge. And that's the ones that he is making atonement for. He says he's, he can have compassion on those who are ignorant and going astray since he himself is also subject to weakness. So qualification number two for this high priest was that he was to be at one with men. He couldn't be at odds with someone. He had to be able to have compassion upon them. If someone came to the temple and said, hey, I've done such and such, I've committed this sin, I know that this is wrong in my life and I am here to make a sacrifice for it. He had to have compassion on that person. He could not just turn them away simply because he could not relate to the person. He had to keep in mind that I'm not higher than that person. I'm not above that person. I've been appointed to this role for a reason. I am the go-between. And now I have to humble myself and say, I know what you're going through because I'm a person just like you are. I have a sinful nature just like you do. And so he had to be at one with men or with other people. So how would you do so far? Would you say that you are able to relate to people? Are you able to be compassionate about people in their sinful state? So here's what William Barclay had to say in this slide I've got up here. Patience is the child of metropathia. There is the word that we find for compassion. It is the word metropathia. I guess I forgot to put that slide in there with my notes. <laughs> But here's what William Barclay had to say about it. This word compassion here is a Greek word, metropathia. And what is it? It is feeling about men in a right way. It becomes a mid-course between explosions of anger and lazy indulgence. So who was this compassion to be directed toward? Those who are ignorant. Those who do not have the right information. What does it mean, those who are ignorant? Let's go to Hebrews chapter 10, verse 26. The writer of Hebrews touches on this several times throughout his writing, but Hebrews 10, 26 is one of the main places where he talks about this person sinning willfully, this person um, being ignorant about what he has done. What is the difference between the two of them. Who is this compassion directed toward? Those who are ignorant, meaning to not have the information or to pay no attention to. Hebrews 10, 26, it says, For if we sin willfully, after we have received the knowledge of the truth, there it is right there, there no longer remains a sacrifice for sins. So this was the deliberate and calloused actions 
that they were dealing with and they did not find atonement in sacrifice when it was deliberate and calloused. So the writer of Hebrews is saying here that he can have compassion on those who are ignorant, but those who are knowledgeable of the sin, this information, this, this sin that they've committed, if they are deliberate and they are calloused about it, if it's a person who is living in a habitual sin, that priest couldn't make a sacrifice for that person. In other words, they're out there, they are living in sin. They have refused to accept God's gift of mercy and grace. They have refused to accept the ability that this high priest has to make atonement for their sins. They have refused to bring a sacrifice to him. It's referring to someone living in habitual sin that needed to come and make a sacrifice. And this one, living in sin, must deliberately make their way back to the high priest in order for him to make atonement for their sins. There's also a reference in Deuteronomy that we looked at the other day. Let's go to Deuteronomy 17. It talks about someone who is acting presumptuously and how they were to deal with that person. Hebrews chapter 17, verses 12 and 13. This is the actual commandment on dealing with a person who is living in habitual sin, this person who is knowledgeable of the mistake that they have made, this person who did not heed the commandment to bring a sacrifice to this high priest. Here's what they were to do to this person. Now the man who acts presumptuously and will not heed the priest who stands to minister there before the Lord your God or the judge, that man shall die. You shall put away the evil from Israel, and all the people shall hear and fear and no longer act presumptuously. So how does this word metropathia impact us? What, what does this compassion that the writer of Hebrews is talking about here, that this high priest had to have, how does it deal with us? Metropathia, it strikes a balance between anger and indifference. We are to be able to take others' failures seriously into consideration, but we're not to be harsh about them. We're to realize that we have our own weaknesses just like they do as well. We are to be compassionate, understanding, responding in humility and not putting ourselves above any other person who may be in a sinful state. The writer here is saying that the earthly high priest could have compassion on those failures and should have compassion on those failures in order to be able to make that sacrifice to help them through this situation that they've fallen into. Point number three in verses three and four is that the earthly high priest offered sacrifices out of obligation. He says this in verse three, he says, because of this, he is required as for the people, so also for himself to offer sacrifices for sins. And no man takes this honor to himself, but he who is called by God just as Aaron was. So qualification number three was this, is that no man could appoint himself to the actual priesthood. The writer of Hebrews refers to Aaron specifically here. As I began to think about that, I began thinking about how did Aaron feel the first time he had to go in on the Day of Atonement. What was his thoughts as he made preparations to go into the Holy of Holies for the very first time as that great high priest, knowing that nobody else has stepped into that role. But here the writer says in verse 4 that Aaron was called by God to do this very thing. And we know the mistakes that Aaron made. Aaron spoke out against uh, Moses. Aaron was the one who allowed the golden calf to be formed while Moses was up on the mountain. He had his imperfections too. So as a role of high priest, it says here that not only did he have to make sacrifices for himself, uh, sacrifices for others, but he also had to make 
sacrifices for himself. His heart had to be pure. His conscience had to be clean. He had to make sure that first and foremost, he himself was in right standings before God, before he could ever think about standing in the gap for someone else on behalf of their sins. So we kind of see how the writer is shaping this up and how he's outlining it, how he's setting it up for a comparison and a contrast between the earthly high priest and Jesus now as our great high priest. So we get into verse 5. The writer actually references a couple of different places in the Old Testament. And he also gets away from referring to Aaron as the high priest and he moves on to another person who was a priest in the book of Genesis. Long before Moses ever came along, long before temple worship was ever formed, long before the tabernacle was ever built, there was this one guy who appeared on the scene. They have no record of his birth. They have no record of his death. And his name is Melchizedek. We've talked about him a little bit in Sunday school here lately. His role and his interaction with Abraham and the role that he filled. But as the writer gets into verse 5, he starts making this comparison with Melchizedek as a type of Jesus Christ found in Genesis. Verse 5, it says, So also Christ did not glorify himself. That word glorify is the word doxosomai is where we get our word doxology from. God glorified Jesus Christ in order to set him up in the role of this high priest. So also Christ did not glorify himself, but God did to become high priest. For it was he who said to him, you are my son. Today I have begotten you. Quoting from Psalm chapter 2 verse 7. He says as he also says in another place he goes to Psalm 110 verse 4. He says you are a priest forever. Here's the difference between the priest that he's referring to in this second half and Aaron as the high priest. Aaron wasn't a high priest forever. We have a record of his life. We have a record of his death. We have a record of the time frame that he served as the high priest. But this guy Melchizedek, he just seems to show up on the scene and then just kind of vanish off in the background. Almost like he was there from the beginning and he was going to be there for the entire time. So the writer here is making a comparison between Jesus Christ and this Melchizedek who showed up on the scenes as priest. So here's the qualification number four, one for Jesus Christ as our great high priest. Christ did not glorify himself. Just as a earthly high priest was appointed by some human being, some mankind, some person in the role that he served in, as he was appointed on men's behalf to deal with the things concerning God, Jesus Christ did not appoint himself in the role, but God Almighty set him up in this role as our great high priest. So there's a shift here as the discussion transitions from the earthly high priest to the heavenly high priest. No longer is the Old Testament Aaron the prototype, but a new type emerges from Genesis chapter 14, verse 1. If you want to turn there, we'll read that verse. And we'll see how Melchizedek just shows up on the scene, kind of vanishes into the background almost instantly, just as quickly as he showed up. Genesis chapter 14, verse 18. Abraham is coming from his victory at Chedorlaomer, and he approaches this place called Salem or Salim, uh, meaning peace, where the word in the Hebrew shalom comes from. Then Melchizedek, who his name means righteousness or righteous king, king of Salim, meaning 
peace. He was the prince of peace. Brought out bread and wine. He was the priest of God most high. And he blessed him and said, Blessed be Abraham, God most high, possessor of heaven and earth, and blessed be God most high, who has delivered your enemies into your hands. He gave him a little uh, tithe of all, all. And now the king of Sodom said, Abraham, give me the persons and take the goods for yourself. And then it seemed like Melchizedek just kind of disappears off of the scene. And he's not mentioned again until this reference in Psalm 110 when it mentions that there will be another priest coming who will be similar to Melchizedek. You're a priest. You're not a temporary priest like Aaron was. You're not a human priest like Aaron was. You're not here for just a short period of time like Aaron was. But you, you're going to be a priest and you're going to be a priest forever just like Melchizedek had no beginning and no end. You will be that righteous king. You will be that prince of peace. You will be the one that I will glorify and set up in the position of the great high priest. So the difference between Aaron El and Melchizedek and their priesthood, we see a definite time frame on Aaron for Melchizedek. He simply appears and vanishes in one or two verses, no record of his birth or death. He is eternal. And so therein lies the reason for this reference according to his order as priest. The next thing we see picking up in verse 7 is that our great high priest meets our failures with forgiveness. While this earthly high priest could only have compassion on our failures. He's not the one who could actually bring complete forgiveness for the sins that he was designated to make the sacrifices for. So Jesus as our great high priest, qualification number two, is not only at one with men, but he also became one as a man. He says right here, he says, who in the days of his flesh, talking about Jesus Christ, earthly Ministry. His name will be called Emmanuel, God with us. God incarnate, God in the flesh. The Son of God became the Son of Man so the sons of men could become the sons of God. He was not only at one with man, but he became one as mankind. And now as our great and faithful high priest, he perfectly fills the role. Because here's the difference between the earthly high priest and the great high priest. In the days of his flesh, when he had offered up prayers and supplications with vehement cries and tears to him who was able to save him from death and was heard because of his godly fear. When is the last time that you've offered up prayers and supplications? When is the last time that you have prayed with vehement cries and tears? See, Jesus Christ did that for you. He did that for me. He did that for all of mankind. There in the garden of Gethsemane, when he prayed, it was as if it were great drops of blood. He knew what lie ahead. He knew the beating that he was going to have to endure. He knew the suffering that was about to take place. It was all written in the book of Isaiah, what, we'd have, what he would have to suffer and what he would have to endure. He had seen people crucified on the cross before, and he knew that that's what he was facing. So when he prayed that night in the Garden of Gethsemane, it wasn't just a simple little prayer. Vehement prayers and supplications and cries and tears. That word vehement means strong, mighty, and powerful. His prayers could do so much more than just a regular earthly high priest. And now as our great 
and faithful high priest, he is continuing to make intercession for us with those same prayers and supplications. He was able to save him from death and was heard because of this. And here's why he was heard, because of his godly fear. Not that he was afraid, but he knew the power of God Almighty. He and God were as one. And so as I began thinking about this, as I began thinking about Aaron and his approach to the Holy of Holies, maybe on the Day of Atonement, maybe for the first time ever, what type of fear did he have? Probably not the same type of fear that Jesus had that night in the Garden of Gethsemane as he was making prayers and supplications for the sin of the world and preparing himself for what he was about to endure, for preparing himself to go and make that one-time sacrifice for all of mankind. I'm sure as Aaron was getting ready, there was a little bit of nervousness to him as they were putting the garments on him, maybe as they were washing him, maybe they were cleaning. What do you think was going through his mind? Man, I, I hope God don't remember that time that I spoke out against his, his faithful servant, Moses. Boy, that would, that would not be good if I went in there and God held that against me. Or, or maybe, maybe that time on Mount Sinai when, when they wanted to put together that golden calf and I allowed them to do it. What, what if God remembers that when I go in? What, what if my heart is just not right with the Lord? I'm very, very certain that Aaron's fear was totally different from the godly fear that the writer of Hebrews is talking about here that caused Jesus Christ's very own prayers to be heard. His vehement cries and tears for you and I there in the Garden of Gethsemane because he knew he was fixing to be the one-time sacrifice for all of mankind. Our great high priest meets our failures not only with compassion but with forgiveness because he is the only one who is able to forgive where we fall short at. This gives new light to 1 John chapter 1, verse 9, where it says, And the blood of Jesus Christ cleanses us from all of our sins. The last point in verses 7 through 11, our great high priest became the requirement for sin because of his obedience. You don't get anything out of this. You look at the word obedience and obey as it is used here in these last closing verses for the night. Verse 7 through 11, who in the days of his flesh when he had offered up prayers and supplications with vehement cries and tears to him who was able to save him from death and was heard because of his godly fear. Though he was a son, yet he learned obedience by the things which he suffered. To me, that's always an incredible statement right there. Thinking that Jesus Christ, that sinless spotless Lamb of God. The Word became flesh, God incarnate. He had to learn obedience while he was here on this earth. I think that's part of the reason why Jesus was born into an earthly family. I think that's why he had an earthly father and mother. I think that's why it's recorded in the Scriptures whenever he was separated from them. And they discovered him, and he paid respect to them. He had to learn obedience during that time. And that obedience carried him all the way through to the death on the cross. Philippians chapter 2 says that he became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. He learned obedience by the things which he suffered. And having been perfected, he became the author of our eternal salvation to all who do what? Obey him. There's that word again. Called by God as high priest according to the order of Melchizedek, of whom we have much to say 
and hard to explain. Since you have become dull of hearing, having been perfected. One of the first things that we notice about this great high priest is that he was heard because of his godly fear. The next thing that we see that he was made perfect. He was being perfected. In verse 9, that word been perfected is a Greek word teleo. It means to bring to a complete wholeness, to prove blameless and to fulfill. And this perfection was made only through his obedience. That word teleo is also used in Hebrews 11, chapter 40, when the hall of faith, as it concludes, the writer of Hebrews uses the same word in two different contexts. Hebrews 11, 30, 40 says that God, having provided something better for us, that they should not be made perfect apart from us. Here in verse uh, chapter 5, he says that Jesus Christ has been perfected. His perfection comes through obedience. Hebrews chapter 11, he says that those found in the hall of faith, they were perfected, but their perfection was made and only accomplished through faith. So what does all this mean for us? What, what does all this mean as we compare our great high priest to what the Old Testament shadows as an earthly high priest? What does all this mean as we look at Jesus Christ and compare him to Melchizedek as a prototype of this righteous king and this high priest? How do we apply what we've looked at in these three comparisons and contrasts between the earthly high priest and our great high priest? If we are to be Christ's followers and if we're going to model our lives after the Lord Jesus Christ. There's a few things that we really, really need to look at in this passage that made Jesus Christ perfected in this role of our great high priest. Because Peter says that we are of a royal priesthood ourselves as we are joint heirs with the Lord Jesus Christ. And if we're to be Christ's followers and if we're to model our lives after his life, one of the first things that made his perfection completed was his obedience. How obedient are you? How often does God have to say something to you before you say, yes, Lord, I'm ready to do that. Yes, Lord, I'm ready to follow you. Yes, Lord, I'm ready to step into that next level that you're calling me to. Also, as Christ followers, we're to learn from Jesus Christ and his compassion. How compassionate are you on others? I'm not talking about those that are just less fortunate than you. I'm talking about those who have been separated, those who have been alienated from the Lord Jesus Christ, those who are walking around in their ignorance of their own sin. Do you think that they should just be doing better? Do you think to yourself that, that they should know better than what they're doing? Do you think that they should be taking care of that issue on their own? They should have never wandered in that area to begin with? Or do you say, you know what? I need to introduce them to Jesus Christ. I was there one time myself. I remember how it felt living in sin with no answers. Can you look back on your life at that time before you knew Jesus Christ? And can you relate to someone in that situation now with a heart of compassion? And can you begin praying for them with vehement cries and prayers 
and supplications in their behalf. Because that's where the third thing comes in at is humility. And he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. As our great high priest, God exalted him, but Jesus Christ had to humble himself to take upon himself the sins of the world. And as we humble ourselves, as we minister to others, we can't look down our nose at them thinking that we're better than they are. We have to do it with a heart of humility. And finally, as he says in verse 11, we can't become dull of hearing. I think the more obedient we are, the more tuned in we are with our hearing of the Lord's voice. I think the more times that we hear the Lord's voice, the more likely we are to be obedient to what he is asking us to do. Let me just say this. We can never become dull of hearing if we are following in obedience. However, we will never ever follow in obedience until we learn to listen and respond and obey when he first calls us and commands us. That song we sang a while ago, I love thee, I love thee, and thou dost know that how much I love thee, my actions will show. You want to live the spirit-filled life. You want to walk like Jesus walked. Look at some of his examples right here in Hebrews chapter 5. His obedience, his compassion as a high priest, his humility in accepting the role and the responsibility of taking on the sins of the world. And this quote at the bottom of your outline from Henry and Mel Blackaby says that the formula to living the spirit-filled life is simply obedience. We have no need of the Holy Spirit if we aren't willing to do what God has asked of us. The power of the Spirit will be seen at our first step of obedience. Would you take that first step tonight? What is it that maybe God has been gnawing on your mind about? What is it that maybe God has been trying to speak into your life? What direction is it that he has been asking you to go in? And have you submitted to that call in your life? Every head bowed and every eye closed. I want to give you a chance to respond to what you heard tonight. Does Nancy come? Just a few verses with piano only. The altars are open. I'm here to pray with you and pray for you. If you want to just get along with the Lord, 